But anyway, title of my message is A Powerful Principle of the Three Ps. And uh, it, it's, it's really amazing that um, what all God's doing in our day. I, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed at times of where we are and living in an age where, and, and y'all got to hear me on this now, we're living in an age where trust in everything from government, media, lawyers, actors, doctors, teachers, pastors, uh, has been shattered. A revival, listen to me, a revival of trust in God's word is here upon us. And it's not that all these things, all these institutions are bad. It's, I'm not saying all teachers, all government leaders, all politicians, actors, all pastors. All, I'm not saying those people are all not bad. So don't leave here, well, he just don't like teachers. He just don't like it. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is all those institutions can be corrupted. But God's word cannot be corrupted. Come on. And so we have, over years, have put our trust in government, in our doctors. Come on, come on are y'all with me? We've put in our trust in that before we've put our trust in God. Because it was easier to go to a doctor. It was easier to go to our teacher. It was easier to go to our government. Come on. It's easier to trust our insurance company. Right? I mean, we got to have insurance for everything. That, that's by design to get your dollar out of your pocket. Right? And so trust in all these institutions have been scattered, shattered in pastors. And so... What we are getting to is God first principle. Starting to put what matters first in God. God's principle is the tie. God first principle is the tie that, that binds and holds everything together. Not our insurance company. Come on. See, in allowing... God first, see, then providence, process, and purpose, it allows that to work. And it's always working in our life. But we don't sometimes recognize it. And not recognizing it can leave us empty, frustrated, come on, looking for answers. And so... It leaves us frustrated and missing the mark, come on, of what our true identity is. See, God's word sets us free. And listen, God's word is always speaking to you of who you really are. See, God's word is always speaking and calling you See, that's that providence process and purpose. It it's, comes through God's word always pulling on you. And so God's word, listen, it sets us free from sin and death. And there's a thief that is trying to rob us of that freedom of really knowing who we really are. See, the thief tries from birth. It works from birth to get us to believing a false identity of who God has created us to be. It, ha it starts happening from birth. You're stupid. You're weird. You're fat. You're clumsy. You're skinny. You're tall. Right? You're short. You're poor. You're too rich. It doesn't matter on what skin 
scale or situation or circumstance where you're at, the enemy's always going to try to think, make, make you think that you're not what God's created you to be. Always. Always. See, he's trying to get you to believe a lie that you're inadequate and unworthy. That's his whole goal. Because when he can start at a little age telling you you're stupid, you're weird, you're, come on, you're different, then he can start making you think you're inadequate, unworthy, and he could put shame on you. And then he can sell you on the fact that you're an addict, you're a drunkard, come on, that you're born that way, you're gay, you're lesbian, you're, come on. You're, you're rotten. You're no good. See, he can, he can start working your identity away from who you're really made to be. Because that's when he can sell you on it. He can make you miss the mark. And the thief wants you to believe all of that so that he can get you living under the thumb of shame. Because shame keeps you from coming out and moving forward in who you really are. Well, you're just a pervert. You're going to always be a pervert. Come on. Your daddy was a drunkard. You're a drunkard. Come on. You're a murderer. You're a hypochondriac. Come on. The devil is trying to put all your racist, your bigoted. Come on. The devil's always trying to talk you into something. You're a gossip. Come on. He's trying to always talk you into something that you aren't. Listen, it's always labeling us, trying to normalize the sin as our identity. Shame wants to label you. Come on. That's just how you are. Are y'all with me? But providence is that God made you, you. God made you to be a woman. God made you to be a man. God made your, every, your fingers, your tall, your height, your every. God made you. You. And you know what? The devil, the enemy, the thief hates you being you. He hates you being you. So he's always going to try to lie to you about who and what your identity is. See, principle is when we start living by a rule or code of conduct. A habitual devotion to right principles. Principles, then I'm going to say it again. When we start living by a rule or code of conduct, this word... Putting it first. Come on. A habitual, that means habit. <laughs> when we make a habit of God, when we make a habit of doing what's right, when we are devoted to right principles. Come on. It's Jack teed this thing right up. If you don't think God, listen, God's after you. But he's wanting you to come after him. And putting right principles in place and doing the right thing to get you from here to here is his intent. So what are you going to do to get to him? What do you need to let go of to get to him? Let me tell you something. When Mary chose to sit at Jesus' feet, that opened the door, she could have sat there and went, and, and just like Jack was saying, begged Jesus to change family, change this, change that. No, she just sat at his feet and later on it reciprocated to her brother coming out of the tomb. Come on. Yeah, that's good. 
but she was willing to go to where he was. Come on now. To see that which was dead and stinking come alive again. Man, y'all take that, put that wherever you want to. See, there is a rule or a code of conduct to be where he is. Listen, we have to have a biblical world view of absolute truth. This word is the absolute truth. So that tells me right there that he made me me. He made me me. Come on. See, when we live with a biblical worldview of absolute truth through Christ, we are guided by the Holy Spirit into truth, come on, of who we really are and what we are called to do here on this earth. Because we are called to do something here. See, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. See, that's you not doing nothing. You can't work it and do it to regenerate you. Come on. He comes to us right where we are in the mess that we are and says, you know what? There's a hope. I can change your identity if you are willing to be where I'm at. If you're willing to accept who I made you to be, I'll change your identity. Because you're not going to do anything to work for it. And when truth finds us, see, process is... Is, here's the thing about, that's all process. The washing, the regenerating, renewing, come on. See, that's that process. Out, that's the out with the old, in with the new. Come on, are y'all hearing me? See, you don't do that work. When truth finds us, we're not at our best. Let's just say. When truth finds us, we're just, we're a pile of mess. See, that, that's what's so powerful about that video. Now, you want to see artwork, and you want to sit, when you hear the, Taylor, that's amazing, the words. The, 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 I mean, you're seeing, you're telling the artwork. It's a mess, and that's how we felt, just paint scattered on a canvas and then it just all messed up, blended together. Come on. How are we going to live fearless in the midst of all that? How are we going to live fearless in the mess that's going on around us? Knowing who our true identity is, that's how. That's how it's going to happen. See, when truth comes in, we begin a journey of truth and discovery. The truth of who we really are and discovering who we really are and why we're here. So see, it doesn't matter if mom and daddy had issues. It doesn't matter who, who had issues, what's been done to you. It, see, those are all excuses that keeps us, that's all shame's excuses that keep us from going and finding out who we really are. Come on. See, the further we go with the Holy Spirit, the more we find out about Jesus. And the more we see Him, the better we can understand us and the work that He has been doing from our birth. Providence. But you have to get in this and you have to set a principle, a habitual, come on, devotion to seeing him in order to see the true you. That's good. 
providence, process, and purpose start to, be, start to become evident when you start reading this right here and putting and trusting it first. Come on. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, here's what's, here's what's amazing here is that is that I originally just wrote down verse 2. And then this morning, it was like, you better go read that again. And so when I went back and I read verse 1, it said, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. Now that word present jumped out at me. Because we are a whole lot about presentation. How we look, how we this, how we, everything is a, won't talk about me, won't talk about I, won't talk about number one, oh my, me, my, what I think, what I want, what I like, what I see, what I see, you know, I mean, we are about <laughs> me. Come on. And here, Paul says, hey, present your, come on. He said, here's what that word meant. To direct, to introduce, to show. And it also means it is an adjective in progress. We are to present, we are to introduce, come on, ourselves a living holy sacrifice acceptable to God. So in other words, there's a lot of things that we have to let go of and be able to introduce the new us. That we've been set aside, set apart, and we're, fixed, we're gonna have a new identity, come on, because we're a new creature in Christ. Come on, does that make sense? So Paul's saying, hey, look, there's more than just saying a prayer here. We have to present and that's very important to where we're headed. See, the thief, this is why the thief fights this so much. He doesn't want you to be introduced as a son of the Most High God. He doesn't want you being seen. He doesn't want you in progress to becoming in the image of his son. Come on, man. Y'all got, y'all hear that? The enemy doesn't want us to be revealed and shown in the midst of all the chaos to be fearless. Come on. He doesn't, he, no, he does not. And he, that's why he wants shame holding us back because we won't step up and walk in that authority as a believer. He doesn't want you to believe <laughs> at all. See, when we first come to Christ, it's because we heard something that fanned an ember within our spirit that only truth can do. Only truth can fan an ember on the inside. Man, when he started singing that, burn, let our hearts burn for you, I was like, ooh, come on, spark them coals. And only truth can do that. 
and it begins to burn again in a hope. In a hope that I'm not born this way. I don't have to stay this way. I don't have to live under, oh, my daddy, my mama, my family. You don't have to live under the excuses that shame is trying to keep you under. Hope, a flame begins to fan. Come on. And it begins to burn. See, we're not what the world or the thief is trying to get us to conform to. He says, don't be conformed, but be transformed. The world is trying to normalize our sin so we'll conform to it. And identify as that. Come on, man. Are y'all with me? Here's the world's answer. Well, we're going to come up with 74 genders so you can pick one to identify by. Let's just slop some more paint on the canvas. Let's just slop a different color. Let's just slop this. Come on, man. Y'all see how powerful that is? And the enemy the whole time is trying to get us to identify with the slop. Come on. See, the regeneration process is about renewing the mind and our identity. And quite frankly, your old identity is where your reputation is, and that's where it needs to die. Come on, y'all got to hear me, and you got to hear my heart here. Because listen, there's more, and God's trying to get us to more. If you want peace... And you want wholeness. That's what this is about. This is not about condemning people where they are. Guilt and condemnation comes from the devil. And only the devil would want you sitting there being offended so that he can keep you under condemnation, so that he can keep you under shame and presenting yourself and your true identity Come on. No longer I was, I am now I am. (laughs) Man, that's right. His identity. Man. See, we're born missing the mark. And providence and process and purpose are always at work to bring us back into right alignment. Come on, are y'all with me? See, John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and might have it abundantly. Now let's look at that for a minute. The word abundantly... In the sense, this is what it means. In the sense of beyond, super abundant in quantity or superior in quality by implication, excessive preeminence. That's what Jesus died for you. In the sense of beyond, super abundant. In quantity or superior in quality, excessive and preeminence. That's what he died for. That's what he came to do. Come on, the word preeminence. It means the quality or state of being noteworthiness. Distinction. Superiority. Come on, some of that, it, it kind of grates on you a little bit. But that's your true identity. It's superior. Super flow, flow us. This, this, is, this cracks me up. Super flow, and for all you English scholars, I ain't even sure I'm saying it right. 
superfluous. See, I told you I wasn't. <laughs> Deb, I'm sorry, Deb. Look at Deb. She can't even, Tom, Debbie, it's so good having y'all here. Tom, Debbie, Debbie, Debbie. <laughs> We've known these two for a long time. How many years did we they say? 25. Tom got saved sitting on a water trough in a feedlot. And let me tell you, you want to talk about a heart that burned and was hungry. I mean, he just, I mean, everywhere we'd go, I mean, he just, and just soaked up the word. Got baptized in the water trough. And been serving God on fire, pastoring churches. Just amazing what God's done in their life and their boys and just to see them. I mean, they were a wreck and a mess just like the rest of us. A couple of Marines, hoo Jim, wherever Jim's at. They had their little Marine reunion when they... <laughs> Sup what? Superfluous. <laughs> Exceeding what is sufficient or necessary. Jesus died so that we would have what was sufficient or necessary. Come on. Pressed down, shaken together, overflowing. I give you a land flowing with milk and honey. Come on. They didn't plant it. They didn't grow it. They didn't cultivate it. They didn't build it. But you know what? They got to go in and grab it because God said it was theirs. And yet we have a hard... It's easier for us to believe a lie from the thief than it is that Jesus died for us to have an abundant life. That we get what's beyond necessary. Come on, isn't that crazy? We accept the fact and the identity we just don't deserve to be happy. Just how many of y'all heard this one? I've heard it a hundred times, if not a thousand times. I just need a little part in heaven, a little corner, just a little piece of heaven. Or how about this? I don't want to bother God. I know he's busy. Do what? I just don't want to bother him. I'm just, I'm just here. I'll struggle and work. That's pride. That is the ultimate pride that you think you can do something to help get you there that you don't want to bother God. You'll just handle it yourself. Well, good luck with that. You can ride that pony till you pull your saddle off that dead sucker. Come on, are y'all with me? See, why is it harder for people to renew their mind to the fact that Jesus died for you to have an abundant life? Why is it so hard to accept that you're accepted just like you are, where you at, and God's calling you further? That you're worthy, you're superior, you're distinctive, and you have more than what's sufficient or necessary. Come on. See, shame is telling us that, that we're unworthy. That's what shame does. Because the thief has done, listen to me, the thief has done a superior job communicating the fact that your identity is totally opposite, come on, of what you truly are. He's communi communicated his message well beyond and better than the church in America has. All we've done is tell people to say a prayer, sit down, and wait to go to heaven. Come on. And so they're frustrated. See, it starts on the playground. All through school, even through religion, fear in media, bad parenting, 
a fallen, twisted culture that can be corrupted and the enemy will corrupt all those institutions. But you have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. I'll never forget when, when, the, when the big evangelist in, in Baton Rouge, uh, uh, when, when the whole uh, Tim Baker, Swagger, that whole thing went down, I remember I was, we were young Christians and the first thought in my mind was is when I started seeing people fall apart, I was like, my eyes weren't on those guys. And I didn't know nothing. But I knew where my eyes were supposed to be. And, and the first thought that came in my head was, they're just human. They're just men. How many believers fell because one man fell? So let me tell y'all something. The lack of faith being exposed in the American church has been happening for a while. Because judgment has already been coming to God's house for a while leading up to this. We just been asleep and missed it. Come on. So this revival of trust has been happening for a long time. And we're just now seeing it. Just now being able to see what's really been going on. See Romans 8, 19, For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And that is, they are waiting eagerly for us to present our bodies. Come on, man. They're waiting eagerly for us to do what Paul said. I urge you to present your bodies, your identity to show, come on, that you're a life in progress. That you're putting things back in order. You're correcting that identity that the thief has been trying to get you to buy into. You're putting it back in order, in correction. Come on, are y'all with me? See, when we take our rightful place as sons and daughters, it communicates a powerful message of providence, process, and purpose and that the people who are willing to hold to a set of principles, the people who are willing to present themselves as holding to a set of principles, come on, are y'all with me? Can possess the promise of God that He said was ours. That's what it's waiting on. But when we can't accept the fact, come on, man, that God created us and then God sent His Son to die for us to get us back and we live under a false identity of who we are, you will never possess the promises of God. Never. You can't even walk into the promises of God if you can't see yourself in them but you got to be able to see yourself in them and you got to be able to let go and quit trusting in swords and come on. You can't trust in human institutions to get you there. You're going to have to trust God's word. Because what shame and what the thief wants you to do is to buy into the lie that you can't possess them. Numbers. Chapter 13. Come on. Let's just go there. Since we're there, let's just go there. Thirty-two. Numbers thirteen thirty-two. This is when Moses sent spies. He sent twelve spies. One from each tribe into the promised land. Go see what we got to do to take it. Go see what's in there. 
They go in. They come back. And they're like, whoo-wee, it is good. Man, look, here's the grapes. The grapes look like oranges. Come on, there was, it was so heavy, they had to carry them on a rod and tote them in. I mean, they had fruit from the promised land that was amazing. And so they go in there and the 12 spies come out. Joshua and Caleb are like, boys, this is what God's been saying. This is what God's been doing. Let's go get it. Ten guys said, yeah, it is good. It is exactly what you said. And here's their report. So they gave out this, to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. They also, there also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And we became, listen, we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. When you can't accept the identity that God created you to be, you can't even see yourself who you really are. And so you're going to have to trust God at his word so when you go in, you don't get devoured and that you can possess what you're going in to take. You can't do it on your own. You got to trust him. Because your own sight, the thief will use against you. Your own feelings, your own emotions, the thief will use against you to keep you from possessing and being recreated into the image that he created you to be in his son. Come on, are y'all with me in here? Because I'm telling you right now, somebody should be flipping the old hanky around in here. I'm telling you, you're giant killers. People are giant killers and don't even know it. See, they can never see themselves possessing the promise. Let me... When God first laid it in our spirit that we was going to have a ranch 20 years went by but let me tell you we always seen ourselves there we always seen ourselves there and every time doubt And every time the fear, and every time the misunderstandings, and every time the enemy would come and say, it ain't going to happen, we could always see ourselves there. Come on. Do what? Yeah, or the counterfeit. Yeah, we we would even see the counterfeit of what he was trying to, to throw up at us. Because he will send counterfeits. And for all you single folks, you get the, you hear me. Counterfeits will come. The enemy won't. I'm going to move on. I'm out of time back there. See, trusting and believing God helps us to see and it defeats shame just takes all the power away from shame when you put it in his hands come on y'all hear what I'm saying because you ain't got nothing to do with it he's the one taking you to get it see the thief is always trying to communicate a message that doubts God's word of truth That's what he's always trying to do. 
the enemy always trying to communicate totally opposite of what God's Word really says. See, He will use our own eyes to deceive us. Come on, man. The thief will rob you of every truth about who you are with excuses out of your own mouth. Out of your own mouth, he'll rob you of going to the promised land. And out of your own mouth, he'll change your vision. Oh, man. That was straight from ranch headquarters. Out of your own mouth, he will change your vision and where you're going to where you can't even see the truth. Exodus chapter 6. He says, The Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion, that means force, he shall let them go. Now under compulsion, force, he shall drive them out of his land. God is telling Moses, hey, I'm really going to tick old Pharaoh off to the point where he's going to harden his heart and he's not going to want to let you go. But then I'm going to make him so mad, he's going to kick you out. <laughs> we will never be accepted as we're passing through this world. You, you might as well go and make your mind up. The enemy don't like you here. The reason he don't like you here is when you start identifying with who you really are in Christ and creation starts to, woo man, when creation gets on board with who, there's it. The world is like, we hate you. You got to go. Well, guess what? We ain't leaving until we're ready to go until God calls us home. And matter of fact, we're going to possess this until he comes gets us. So you can just lump it there, buddy. We're going to keep holding to a set of principles and a code of conduct that points people to him. And we're going to shine in a, come on, man, in a dark world, in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all the mess. We're just going to be standing there fearless for everybody to see. No matter what they try to do, no matter how they try to shut it down, we're still here until God says, you know what? People see who I am. Y'all come on up here. Let's leave them to their own devices. Let's leave them to their own corrupt vices. Son, go get your bride. That's how ugly this is going to get. The world's fixing to get real ugly. It's going to get real ugly. But you know what's going to be shining like a diamond in a billy goat's butt? I'm sorry, Deb. <laughs> Deb, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. <laughs> I, will, I will recover. Us. <laughs> Shining like a diamond. Yeah. Come on, y'all hear what I'm saying? It's going to be chaos, and, and here we are. People seeing God, the sons of God, walking in the image of the one who created them. All the while, people are going, man, there is hope. Man, there is hope. 
That's what the truth is. That's what... Exodus 23, and I will be quiet after this. I promise this is it. See, the world is just never going to be comfortable with us in it. They just won't. But the whole time we're proving that God's God. Do what? <laughs> oh, help us, Lord. Progress. Progress. Yeah. I'm a yeah. Progress. Little by little. Verse 29. <laughs> I will not drive them out before you in a single year that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. I'll drive them out before you little by little till you become fruitful, take possession of the land. Come on, man. When we accept who we are, when we accept that, we truly are possessing what God says we are going to possess. And then He drives out the enemy before us. So see, we don't have to be a, we don't have to be a super Christian. I don't know what else to say. I, we, don't, we, can, we, can, we are in progress. And little by little, we are going to present ourselves. Come on. See, I don't know the timeline of how long it takes some. I'm still in this. I'm still in progress, as you know. I just happen to be driving the bus here. I don't, you know, you, you chose to get on, okay? <laughs> you chose to take this ride. So put your seatbelt on and get ready. <laughs> But here's where we're going. At least our bus has cool four-wheel drive. <laughs> but see, we're all a work in progress. That's why it says, now therefore there's no guilt or condemnation for those who are in Christ. See, and then God began that providence and that process and purpose begin to work us, come on, to where we begin to identify as sons and daughters of Christ. Does that make sense? And little by little, we learn to possess us. We, we, we're, we're reprogramming that when temptation comes, we go, no, I see this for what it is. If Jesus Christ himself was tempted, you're going to be tempted too. We're all going to be tempted. There's no, listen, there's always a temptation to go back to the lie that that was life and it was good. Come on. Because that was the lie we believed, but that's not really the truth. The truth is, Jesus died for us to live an abundant life so that we could be the light that shines in the darkness. Come on, man, that is so good. Y'all stand. See, God's intent is we learn to possess the land and bear fruit in it. To live out the promises. See, when we're, when we're possessing and bearing fruit, we're living out the promises. So therefore, we begin to communicate the message of thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've said that prayer so long as a ritualistic prayer, we don't even know what it means. 
We don't, even, we don't even have any idea that it means that we are to possess and bear fruit. Come on. And live in the promises of God. That people can see. And in the middle of the madness and all the confusion and all the chaos. Our identity is in Christ and the world sees him. The world sees him. See, but we have to present that. Are y'all with me? See, you can come in here and be a drunkard, an addict, but you can't come in here and do that. You, you, does that make sense? I, I don't mind. I, listen. <clears throat> There's some of you boys in here know this because y'all have lived through this. What you did last night, I don't care. You're not going to do that in here, but you get here. Does that make sense? Because you can't present if you don't continue to come. Is that making sense? See, I don't care if you're an addict. You're not going to do it here, but you can come here. But you need to be here because the only way you can kick it and learn to possess and take and bear fruit for the kingdom is if you come here. I'm not going to tell you, you better quit doing all this. You better quit doing That's not what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you, you need to quit doing that. Because you're not going to be able to go any further into your true identity but don't quit coming here. You keep coming because eventually you're going to walk out of that and little by little, God's going to teach you how to live without that. See, He's going to drive those enemies out before you and you're going to possess what the enemies had of yours And you're going to begin to take it back. Come on, are y'all with me? That's what creation longs to see. Not where you come into a church and everybody tells you, you better quit this, you better... Mm -mm. No, you're going to learn, learn to possess the land. To live out. And let me tell you something. At that point, what she said was, is that that relationship can't be taken away from you. And at that point of that relationship, building to where you're trusting in nothing but Him, you can't be offended. Because here's what the enemy is always trying to do. He's always trying to remind you of your trespass and everybody's trespass against you. The enemy wants you living under the shame of your trespass and all the trespasses trespassed on you. See, that's why we have a world that's so jacked up right now and so easily offended that we have to have cry rooms at colleges. You want to talk about somebody who don't know who their true identity is? It's a corrupt system. It's a corrupt system when you've got to have a cry room. Get a prayer room. You get a prayer room, it'll get you out of a cry room. 
Oh, man, I'm... <laughs> Father, I come to you. Lord, I pray for every person that's listening on the airwaves here. If you're struggling with your identity, if you're struggling, struggle no more. Jesus died that you may have life and life abundantly and that the devil can't rob from you any longer. Lord, I pray that this belief that we are made for more begin to burn in our hearts. That we are made for more to silence the enemy Lord, I thank you that in the midst of a corrupt generation, Father, I thank you that we stand as a light to lead those out to communicate a message of hope. And Father, I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love y'all. We will.